climate change is so big that most of us fear we can't do anything that would make a difference, but that's not true because today we'll be catching you up on the latest science of the climate crisis and about an ambitious yet realistic plan to avert the worst of it. Here to give you the bad news and the good news is Ellie Cohen, CEO of the Climate Center. Prior to joining the Climate Center, Ellie served as president and CEO of Point Blue Conservation Science, where she and the organization's more than 160 scientists worked with hundreds of public and private partners to develop climate smart solutions for wildlife and people. During her 20 year tenure at Point Blue, she helped to grow the organization fivefold to a workforce of 200 people and an annual budget of $14 million. Three of her proudest collaborative achievements were winning official observer NGO status at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, securing about $100 million of conservation investments, and guiding 95% of the urbanized coast of California in preparing for sea level rise and extreme storms. Ellie is now bringing all this skill and expertise to bear on an exciting project to decarbonize California, which she will talk about today after she briefs us on the climate crisis. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ellie Cohen. Ellie, welcome to Forum 2020. We are honored to have you kick off our Forum 2020 series. Thank you so much, Anne Christine and everybody at Environmental Forum of Marin. It is my honor and pleasure to be here today. Uh, especially because this morning the sky was blue over my house in San Anselmo. It made me very happy, for the moment at least. So yes, I will be speaking today on No More Business as Usual, Climate Safe California and the Path to Net Negative Emissions by 2030. I am CEO of the Climate Center. Our mission is speed and scale greenhouse gas reductions. We're perhaps best known for our key role in growing community choice energy, uh, from two just five years ago to 21 CCAs, serving 11 million Californians today, a quarter of the state with 88% clean electricity. We're really proud of that. It's a great example of speed and scale greenhouse gas reductions. We have a lot more to do and our Climate Safe California builds on this, but I'm gonna first start with some overview of where we are today, some of the recent science, get into some of the policy making opportunities in California, and end with some inspiration about what we can all do to make a difference. It's a great cartoon. Just it's, sometimes it's hard to remember with all that's been going on that we are still in the midst of a pandemic. Um, but this cartoon says it so well, and we're experiencing in the past few weeks that larger wave, or both of those waves, of economic challenges and climate change. There's a lot of similarities really between COVID-19 and climate change. And I wanted to take a moment just to think about, despite the horrible toll on families and communities from the incredibly high number of people who've died and gotten sick from COVID-19 and also the economic repercussions, that there's also been some opportunities in there that might shed some light on what we can do in climate change. Clearly, heeding the science and the experts is critical for our future. Advanced preparation saves lives. Tipping points happen quickly and abruptly, both in a positive way and a negative way. Healthy ecosystems sustain life and make us more resilient. We are only as resilient as the most vulnerable. It is about shared responsibility, the we, not the me, which is not human instinct all the time, but that is what we need to do. And COVID, as well as climate change, exemplifies that. Individuals make a difference and we need coordinated government action and we can act quickly. We're seeing that governments will invest billions, actually trillions, and change behavior very quickly when the political will is there. So uh, during April, we had a reduction in emissions globally of around 17%. The estimate now is somewhere at a maximum of 5% drop in emissions globally over this entire year to get to where we need to be, we have to do more than double that at least every year. Double that. So thinking about what happened in March and April and everybody being at home, many of us still are working from home, but how the economy really shut down. We need to do much more than that, but do it in a way that keeps the economy going. And a great uh, analogy of this is this bathtub analogy. So basically with COVID, we've turned the faucet down just by a tiny amount that faucet of greenhouse gas emissions by 5%, it's still gushing into the atmosphere, which is the bathtub. In addition, 
we have filled the bathtub already with all of our activities over really 10,000 years of human civilization, and uh, especially the last few decades of burning of fossil fuels, cutting down forests, disturbing soils, and putting huge amounts of greenhouse gases, warming greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. What we need to get to is turning that faucet off completely or almost off and opening up the drain. So that's the sequestration, pulling out the emissions from the atmosphere so that we empty that the, the um, bathtub back to the amounts that it was pre industrial era at least. So just keep thinking of this bathtub imagery. That's what we need to get to. So here in California, our house is on fire. As the LA Times headline said the other day, that the hellscape is here and people are afraid. This is a, a satellite picture from last Wednesday when we all woke up to the eerie orange skies. This is a view from my house. I mean, unbelievable, really frightening. And even though we all intellectually know climate change is already here, there is something about experiencing it that made it very visceral and real for us. Here's the LA Times headline from Sunday. Maybe the first time in the country that a major newspaper linked a catastrophic event in nature to climate. I'm really glad that this uh, was done. Very, very powerful. Here's the real challenge. Our current global climate goals and our state climate goals are inadequate to meet this challenge. So most countries today that are considered on the progressive front line edge of uh, advanced efforts on climate change are following the recommendations from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report from 2018. And this was the report that was requested from the UN to say, what, what does it take to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius warming globally in the industrial era? And uh, they said, the scientists concluded, we have to cut emissions essentially in half by 2030. And we have to remove upwards of a trillion tons of warming greenhouse gases from the atmosphere over the decades ahead. And finally, we have to get to net zero or carbon neutral, carbon neutrality by 2050. Here's the challenge. The United Nations operates by consensus. So the goals are necessarily conservative. They also have to be run through all of their policymakers after the scientists put it out. This recommendation to cut emissions in half by 2030 this recommendation is the most conservative recommendation. And what we have found now in the past two years since this study came out, that there's a lot more science showing us that climate change is rapidly worsening and accelerating, and we have to do a lot more much sooner. Uh, I'm gonna go through a bunch of recent studies here. Abrupt ecosystem collapse is likely this decade starting in tropical oceans and then moving on to terrestrial habitats. It's only deep emissions cuts soon that could save thousands of species and those ecosystem functions that sustain life as we know it. This news is just from yesterday that the West Antarctic ice shelves are literally unhinging. You can see in this photograph, and this is possibly leading to 10 feet of sea level rise. I mean, this is huge. No one expected this to happen so quickly, so soon. Um, abrupt permafrost thaw. Uh, scientists have found that this doubles previous carbon dioxide and methane emissions estimates. And as the lead scientist on this said, these are not in any of the climate models, including the IPCC 1.5C report. So she asked, how realistic are our projections without permafrost feedbacks? But we can definitely stave off the worst if we act in the next decade. Another study shows we've had a huge amount of methane increase in the atmosphere over the past 10 years. And uh, it's been found that more than a third of that is due to increased in fracking. And almost all of that fracking is due to US fossil fuel production. Methane is a very powerful warming compound, 86 times stronger than carbon dioxide over its 10 to 20 year lifespan. Um, Bob Howorth, who's a professor at Cornell, who I had the honor of meeting at one of the UN climate uh, uh, gatherings in Bonn, Germany, he says that reducing methane now might be one of the most important ways to slow global warming. He calls that an instant solution to doing it, to at least begin that process. Uh, Western US, we are now in a global warming induced severe mega drought. If you think about it, 
Uh, we have records that go back about 1200 years from lake cores and tree rings. And it turns out that the 20th century, when California grew from about 2 million people to almost 40 million, it was an anomaly because we had such wet periods. It was probably the wettest century on record. And now we're seeing that we're in a normal period of multi-decadal drought, but with climate change, instead of it being a moderate drought, it becomes a severe drought. And uh, just pointing out one fact from 2015, the drought that one year cost our economy 2.7 billion and lost 20,000 jobs in agriculture. So it's huge challenges. I also had the opportunity to speak with a lead scientist from Scripps down at UC San Diego a couple weeks ago. His name is V. Ramanathan. And uh, he told us that he has a paper coming out in the next couple of weeks that shows that California will surpass that 1.5 C limit probably sometime between 2027 and 2035. And with everything accelerating, it could be on the early, very likely will be on the early end of that. So that means that as soon as six or seven years from now, we could be seeing dust bowl like conditions in California that could lead to most of the crops we currently grow today not being able to be grown. I mean, this is huge. And we're really talking about what sustains life as we know it. Another study that came out recently, fall fire weather days have doubled since 1980 in California, but we can reverse that trend with major greenhouse gas reductions. This, by the way, is a picture from Australia from last year, but it, we've had this in California over the past month, these pyrocumulus fire clouds <clears throat> that create dry lightning and actually ignite more fires. And really, it's not just climate change that has made the fires. I, I want to be really clear about that, that it's also been over 100 years of fire suppression because we live in, a, in ecosystems that are fire prone naturally. And Native Americans burned forests around them over 20,000 years of that to manage the forest, knowing that forest fires were, and fire in general, was part of our ecological heritage here. So what do we need to do? We need controlled burns on a much bigger scale than we're doing right now. We need mechanical thinning, and we need to apply that kind of traditional, traditional ecological knowledge at scale. Uh, this is a picture from the recent Creek Fire, which is still burning up in the Sierras. And just remembering that I, I think they had to evacuate over 200 people because that fire moved so quickly. It burned something like 250,000 acres in 24 hours. This is the kind of force that we're dealing with today. And we have to remember that it isn't just the habitat management, it isn't just uh, climate change, but all kinds of land use changes and more pollution that actually increases the impacts and reduces our resilience from development and open space to plastic production. And the picture on the bottom right here is of microplastics in soil. We're finding microplastics everywhere in the air we breathe and in our soil. So we have huge challenges ahead that have enormous impacts on health and especially to our most vulnerable low income communities where extreme heat is in fact the most deadly. And you add on top of that a global pandemic and uh, a lot more people are very vulnerable to becoming sick, not just from climate change, but from uh, these respiratory illnesses that um, uh, COVID and other recent pandemics have uh, brought to us. I want to point out in terms of uh, really climate justice <clears throat> that five and a half million Californians live within one mile of oil or gas wells. Five and a half million Californians. What does this do? It's due to historic redlining, to racist redevelopment policies. Almost all of these communities are communities of color. And uh, California is the seventh largest oil producing and third largest refining state in the country. The Western States Petroleum Association is the most powerful corporate lobby in California. It spent eight and a half, $8.8 .8 million on lobbying in 2019 alone. And we have over 80,000 active and idle oil and gas wells, pumps, refineries, and pipes that produce high rates of asthma, respiratory diseases, and cancer from the toxic compounds that come from them. This is a huge issue that needs to be addressed in California. A lot of times we think of California as being a leader on climate change, 
but we can't be until we really address this issue. And I did want to just share this picture. There have been a lot of videos on Twitter in the past few weeks of farm workers, any hourly paid employees essentially, or workers have to go to work to take care of their families through COVID, through climate change, through smoke storms. And here we see uh, that these workers who are providing our food um, are out every single day, regardless of how awful the air quality has been. We need to just remember that service workers of all kinds are risking their lives to support many of us here in Marin County who may be middle class or upper middle class and we benefit from their labor. And uh, taking quick action on climate change will make a big difference for them as well. So if we remember any of the science today, <clears throat> it's that nine of 15 global tipping points have already been activated. The people who did this study, for, this first came out in 2010 where they laid out these 15 global tipping points. They did not expect this kind of change so quickly. They didn't think they would be reporting anything like this until 2030 or 2040. Here we are in 2020. And if we don't act soon, this could lead to a domino effect. And one of the lead authors of it, I won't read the top statement, but just to say that we've underestimated the risks. We need to declare a state of planetary emergency to unleash world action. We don't want to push the on buttons of runaway global warming. The next decade is our window with consequences for all future generations. The science is clear. Another study looked at 5 million climate pathways and only a handful had a positive future for us. And they said, we have to aggressively pursue carbon neutrality by 2030, not 2045, which is California's current policy, not 2050, which the IPCC uh, got from the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But we have to, we need it by 2030 and probably sooner. Um, to, and we have to hope for some luck for a tolerable climate. What we're finding is that the climate system globally is much more sensitive than even the top scientists thought. And finally, on the economic side, all of this costs when we don't take action at the level we need to do, it costs us a lot. So this level of inaction is bankrupting our economy. In 2019 alone, due to wildfires, we spent 80, well, we spent 80 billion or we had in losses $80 billion in insured and uninsured losses, just in 2019 alone. Our pre-COVID budget this year was 220 billion. That's an enormous percentage of that budget. Climate change threatens US financial markets. This is from a study that came out last week that was under the Trump administration. And it said threatening US financial markets, including insurance and mortgage markets, pension funds, and other financial institutions, and another study showed that a one-year delay in adopting these conservative 1.5C pathway globally cost $5 trillion in 2020. That's the cost of not doing massive greenhouse gas reductions. And the damages for delayed reductions in the US in 2020 cost $600 billion. We don't take that into account when we're looking at this. So carbon neutrality or net zero emissions I have a question for everybody. Is it enough? I can't hear you. <laughs> if we were all together, I know you would be saying, no, no, we have to do more than that. And you would be correct. Because we need to get to carbon neutrality, but we need to go beyond that. We need to get to net negative emissions where sequestration, where drawdown of warming compounds from the atmosphere is greater than the emissions that we're producing. If just think of that bathtub image, for us to have any hope of getting to a safe climate, which some have defined as 1.5 degrees Celsius warming, but here today we're at 1.1 C and we're already experienced the devastating impacts of climate change. So really we want to get down to at least 350 parts per million and even lower than that of uh, carbon dioxide equivalents in the atmosphere. And that means what we call net negative emissions or the start of drawdown. The climate reality is outpacing outdated science and policy, but our leaders are now stepping up. So what's exciting in the past few months, we finally have Democrats at the national level at least proposing new climate targets, which is really exciting. California is behind, but maybe not too far behind depending on what we do. The Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force, uh, the, I, I'm just going to highlight one policy from each of these. 
um, is calling for eliminating carbon pollution from power plants, which really means uh, greenhouse gas free electricity by 2035. Uh, we don't have that in California. The House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis is calling for 100% zero emission vehicles, cars and light trucks by 2035. We have no law in place in California that ends internal combustion engine cars at all. The Senate Select Committee on the Climate Crisis calls for investing 2% annually of our gross domestic product with, in climate action with 40% to low income communities. If we did that in California today, that would be the equivalent of $64 billion annually. And the DNC Climate Committee is calling for 100% clean renewable energy by 2030 in electricity generation, buildings and transportation. This is exciting. Our national leaders are finally getting with the latest science and really beginning to address these issues. And all of these include some version of just transition, which I'll explain in just a moment, and closing the climate gap, looking at um, climate injustice. And what happened on Friday? Governor Newsom said very strongly, he actually said we are in a climate dam emergency, but I didn't put that in the headline. And he said, we have to fast track our goals. We need to help him make sure that really happens. But this is an exciting step in the right direction and a time for the governor to take on truly bold leadership that can make a difference for California and the world. Now, California's the last year that we had measured emissions for is 2017. About 41% of our emissions come from transportation. And you can see the other sectors that are measured in California listed here. We have a huge challenge as the world's, or at least California's uh, biggest car, uh, sorry, the United States' largest car market, uh, California's transportation issues are quite significant and really a big challenge for us, but we can do it with the political will. I want to share this study that came out last year showing that SUVs are the second biggest cause of emissions rise globally. If you put them together, it would be equal to the UK and Netherlands combined. It would rank as the seventh largest emitter of emissions in the world, SUV drivers. And no offense to any of you who have SUVs, but we need to get rid of them and we need to move towards electric vehicles and more mass transit and other solutions. I also want to share that California isn't counting all of our emissions. Consumption-based, or what we call out-of-boundary emissions from goods and services, are not counted by the state of California. And if we're going to truly follow science and do what's right to make a difference on climate change, we have to look at this also. Here's a picture of a truck. I, I had a, um, some meetings down in LA pre-COVID back in January, and uh, we actually counted something like 23 prime trucks on the way down. Um, I have changed this picture slightly to say there's more emissions to prime, and I can say I am guilty of doing this, but we have to find ways to consume less and ways to make this cycle of consumption and production um, much, have a much smaller climate footprint. And these are all the ways that um, this consumption-based efforts work. But I wanted to show Marin, if we took Marin emissions, that the sim they're very similar to the state where it's about 40% transportation, and you added these out-of-boundary or consumption-based emissions, it changes this picture quite dramatically and you would really want to ensure that you address that as well. So California has to lead for the country and the world to secure a climate safe future. We've met with many scientists over the past eight months talking about our vision for what we need to do in California. And not just scientists, but policymakers, including our own Congressman, Jared Huffman, who was quite clear that no matter who gets elected in the presidential race, even if it's Biden, and hopefully it will be, because of he, they will be advancing uh, climate safe type policies, even then, we need California to do a lot more to demonstrate what's possible, to be a leader, and we influence not only our country, but the world. So we need more aggressive policies and accelerated timelines in California now. We developed a year ago this campaign for rapid decarbonization that we call Climate Safe California. Our goal is that by 2025, California will have enacted the bold policies required by science to dramatically reduce emissions, start that drawdown, and secure resilient communities for everyone in California by 2030, inspiring global action. So what does that really mean? 
We want to accelerate existing state goals so that by 2030, we get to 80% below 1990 levels of emissions. This was actually an executive order from Governor Schwarzenegger in 2005, but with a deadline of 2050. With all we know today, we need to move that up 20 years. And we want to reach net negative emissions where sequestration is greater than emissions, where drawdown has begun um, by 2030. And that was an executive order from Governor Brown in 2018 to happen by 2045. It, the actual uh, executive order said, we want to get to carbon neutrality by no later than 2024 and 2045 and immediately follow that with net negative emissions. Well, we know today we have to do a lot more than that. We need to move these up to 2030. We have two key guiding principles for us to be successful. Number one is support workers dependent on fossil fuel enterprises. We have to do that. In Sacramento, one of the most powerful entities there, maybe more powerful than the governor, is not the oil and uh, utilities, but actually the unions that represent them. They are very, very powerful. They know what's going on. They see the writing on the wall, but we have to work with them. We have tens of thousands of people employed in high paying jobs with great pensions and with health care. They care about their families as each of us does. We need to help them ensure what is called a just transition to move to other kinds of employment so we can very rapidly move away from fossil fuels and help create jobs with them as we solve climate change together. And second, we have to prioritize climate justice. Climate safe policies have to ensure that lower income communities are no longer disproportionately harmed by fossil fuel development, production and use, that these policies have to prioritize lower income communities and communities of color because we know that climate justice is racial justice and we want everyone to participate in this clean energy economy. When I got my first electric car uh, about 10 years ago, I was able to take advantage of state policies, but it was very complicated and I found it very challenging to do. And for many people who do not have the support and ability to do that, well, this is a pretty hard thing. We need to ensure that these policies are available to everybody and they're easy and to access and easy to take advantage of. So here's a summary of what we're proposing. This red bar here is the 1990, oops, sorry, 1990 levels of emissions, 431 million metric tons. This is what the state celebrated and really celebrated last year. Yay, we got below 1990 levels by 2020. That was our goal. But what is that really? 424 million metric tons, year zero. We have a long way to go. This is not enough. Current policy in California, we want to get to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. Year zero. Is that enough? I can't hear you. <laughs> no, it's not enough at all. What we're saying is some version of this, it doesn't have to be exactly this, but this blue bar here shows 80% below 1990 levels or 86 million metric tons of emissions and the beginning of drawdown with 100 million metric tons sequestered through nature-based solutions, which I'll explain a little more in just a moment, leaving us with net negative 14 million metric tons or the start of drawdown. So I just want to explain that overall picture of where we need to go. It's a dramatic change and we have to do it and we can do it. We have the know-how, we have the technology, we just need the political will. So what are the key policies required by science to reach net negative emissions by 2030? We have to accelerate the phase out of fossil fuel development, production and use. We have to dramatically increase sequestration. We need massive investments in community resilience and we have to fund climate action. I'm gonna spend a few minutes in each of these right now to explain some of the detailed policies. We have to immediately halt new oil and gas drilling. That kind of infrastructure stays around for 30 or 40 years. The governor has approved, I think, um, 48 new fracking permits this year, and there have been thousands of other permits that have been allowed. We should not allow any new permitting whatsoever because we know we can't survive with new wells and oil being drilled. We cannot do that. And we need to immediately start capping the old wells that are leaking methane 
as we've talked about earlier, a very powerful warming compound. We have to ensure significantly greater greenhouse gas-free transportation and mobility, secure 100% greenhouse-free electricity, which we know we can do, and we want to electrify most everything with massive greenhouse gas reductions in new and older buildings. So in terms of sustainable mobility, we need to begin to phase out fossil fuel powered vehicles, cars, trucks, buses, ships by no later than 2025. And that means no longer permitting any new ICE vehicles as internal combustion engine or gas powered vehicle registrations by no later than 2030. There are countries around the world who are doing this. Norway will ban um, new internal combustion engine cars as soon as 2025. We can do it also, but we have to start now. We need to flip our priorities and invest 80% of Caltrans money in non-greenhouse gas sustainable modes of transportation. That right now we spend 80% of that money on freeways and infrastructure. We gotta flip that no later than 2025. We need to invest in affordable housing near jobs. We have to invest in clean mass transit and we have to accelerate investments in telecommuting really universal internet for workforce, for the workforce, for students, for businesses and government. We need more investment in zero emission vehicles and charging stations. It's grown, but we need a lot more. We today have about 650,000 zero emissions vehicles. Uh, it was a 33% increase from 2018 to 2019, but the current goal in California is to get to 5 million zero emission vehicles out of 26 million total, it's not enough. We have to at least double that goal, dramatically increase charging infrastructure and get a lot more people out of cars. We also need a major increase in building electrification and efficiency. For those of you who love your gas stoves, we need to give them up. And there's some incredible electric induction stoves and other things, but we cannot continue with natural gas not so much, well, they do have toxins that are released into your home, but the entire life cycle of natural gas production releases huge amounts of methane, and we need to shut it down. Buildings are responsible for 25% of greenhouse gas emissions in California. Over 20 cities have enacted methane gas bans for new buildings, and there's efforts to have zero emission building codes by 2025. And finally, I just wanna mention that we need to ban gas-powered lawn equipment which just one hour of lawnmower use is equal to driving 300 miles from LA to Vegas in a gas powered vehicle. The second main area, and I, I think of it as legs of a stool, the, the seat is net negative emissions by 2030. And then we have four policy legs. One is that the rapid phase out of fossil fuels. The second leg is increasing sequestration. We need to sequester an additional 100 million metric tons of carbon dioxide annually, and we can do it through healthy soils, through forest management and vegetation annually by 2030, starting no later than 2022, because nature doesn't change like that. But we've seen all over the world, even in very arid habitats, that we can make soils wet year round. We can support vegetation growth. We can make us more resilient to drought and to fire and other climate impacts. And we can do it in a big way with carbon farming and gardening, climate smart habitat restoration and management and enhancing protected habitats. Um, a study came out a couple of years ago showing that croplands alone could sequester about a fifth of our current annual emissions globally if we manage them for carbon sequestration. And then you get all these other benefits, including food security and holding more water in the soil. So here in California, carbon farming has huge potential at scale. California is about 104 million acres. So we could sequester at least, and this is very conservative, 20 million metric tons a year on 20 million acres of cropland and through carbon farming on rangelands as well. Riparian restoration has a huge potential. In the Central Valley alone, 95% of this streamside habitat has been lost due to agriculture and development. If we restore even a portion of that, we'll get all kinds of benefits for sequestration, for clean water, for fisheries, filtering out pollutants and slowing down floods. So huge co-benefits from all of these investments. And I wanted to just point out that at the Climate Center, we've done a series of webinars since last March, and they're all available online at theclimatecenter.org slash webinars. One that we did just in August was about soil as a climate solution that's available to watch online. It's an hour long, um, a presentation with Tori Estrada and Wendy Millett, two experts on 
um, carbon sequestration and carbon farming. And you can learn a lot more if you're interested in that. The third pillar is investing in community resilience. Right now, well, we're experiencing it all firsthand with the smoke, but the California state legislature has required that every county and city have a resilience plan. I'm very honored to be on the sustainability commission in our tiny town of San Anselmo here in Marin. And we struggle to find every dollar for our work on resilience and climate action. The state has not put money behind this. We need to invest in a big way to make sure that all of California's counties and cities can not only have these plans, but implement resilience measures. Another part of resilience is clean energy community microgrids with backup battery storage so that we are not dependent on PG&E when there's an outage somewhere else and the whole county has to shut down and it has all kinds of health impacts and economic impacts. We can do a lot better by implementing community energy microgrids. So instead of perpetuating this hundred year old grid architecture with a transmission network that's prone to failure and likely to start fires, we can create a decentralized and integrated power grid with clean energy, where we link thousands of local electricity systems in this macro grid, but each one is an island unto itself. And we can then be, have energy independence and bring California into the 21st century. One of the efforts we're working on at the Climate Center is to change the California Public Utility Commission rules to fast track um, my, the opening of a microgrid market. So right now, my neighbor, uh, where I live, I'm, I have a, uh, I'm on a north facing slope where we can't have solar. I do get 100% um, deep green from marine clean energy. So I'm happy for that. But I, I can't buy solar from my neighbor across the street who is in the sun because of archaic old rules or monopoly rules from PG&E and other utilities that lock it in. And so we're working at the CPUC right now to open up this market, to open it up for microgrids, to revise regulations so these small scale clean energy providers, even my neighbor across the street, could actually sell electricity to me. And we need to prioritize clean energy resilience and make it accessible for low income communities. The fourth area is funding climate action. We need to institute progressive funding strategies because we're going to need at least 12 to 20 billion a year specifically for climate action in California, above and beyond our current budget. One big area that we can work in are these regulatory changes, just like I was talking about, that open up markets so private investments can be part of paying for what's needed. I did a back of the envelope calculation and we could do frequent flyer fees. So in 2018, this is pre-COVID, but in 2018 there were 240 million passengers from the top eight airports in California. So if I flew from San Francisco to LA and back, I would be a passenger twice. If we charge $10 per passenger, we could raise $2.4 billion, much more than we're getting from cap and trade right now, and invest that in climate action. And there's all kinds of other ideas like a fossil fuel severance tax, enhancing cap and trade, green climate bonds, closing tax, tax loopholes, and progressive carbon taxes. We're going to need all of it, and we're going to have to work towards these kinds of changes in order to get the funding needed. The bottom line is we have the solutions and technologies today to solve the climate crisis, and California can be a leader in making this happen. Economically, it pays off. It creates jobs and builds the economy. 2.2 billion from California's cap and trade program from 2013 to 2016 supported direct employment of 36,000 jobs or job years. And that was in the building trades and architecture and engineering and in transportation. It's huge. Recent studies about the economic impact of climate investments show that $80 billion invested in California would generate 725,000 jobs. Investments in clean energy generates more than twice the jobs as fossil fuels. And yet another study showed the current California emissions reduction goals, which are too conservative, but those alone would yield an estimated 21 billion in economic and other benefits. Once again, this is Climate Safe California. This is our goal of what we need to get to by 2030. This is a more detailed version showing California's policies on um, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions here. And from 1960 to the present here, we've 
beginning to have some reductions in emissions, but this is showing the steep curves that we need to implement to get to a climate safe California in each of the measured sectors. With Climate Safe California, as of today, we have 550 endorsements, including elected and appointed uh, officials in the state, academics and economists, businesses, NGOs, and faith organizations. We invite you to endorse today at climatesafeca.org and ask that you ask others to endorse as well to really bring about the kind of policy change we need. As I mentioned earlier, we need the political will. We are working with many other partners across the state of California to build the broad support needed for climate action with labor, environmental justice, healthcare, ag community, real estate, insurance, energy, environment, local government, transportation, and others. Our first phase of this effort is securing endorsements, as I mentioned, establishing a new statewide Climate Safe California Alliance, which we're doing with workers and healthcare and other entities building bridges across silos. The climate movement is very siloed. We need to find this sort of like a Venn diagram. We wanna get everybody at least sharing this common goal of accelerating our goals for 2030. We're working on building clout in Sacramento and have already had some legislation this year on community energy resilience. We're engaging experts to develop science-based pathways and policies so we can do a lot more detail than what I just did to get to net negative emissions. We're um, already starting to publish white papers and opinion columns um, with other opinion leaders and influencers, building regional partnerships. And we're raising money to make this happen. We think we're gonna need 25 million. We have raised 2 million to date and we need to raise another 2 million by the spring of 2021. Here's a quote from our Congressman, Jared Huffman. I applaud Climate Safe California for recognizing that solving our climate crisis requires setting the bar high enough to actually meet the challenge. I endorse this effort to keep California on that course, leading our country and the world toward climate solutions. And one other quote from Terry Taminen, who was the EPA secretary under Governor Schwarzenegger, and now actually invests in clean energy efforts all over the world he said, uh, I strongly endorse the goal of Climate Safe California to achieve net negative emissions by 2030. 2050 is too late. The campaign's focus on science, urgency, and policy is exactly what's needed, and California must lead the way. So I invite you to endorse Climate Safe California, and there's all kinds of other actions you can take. Number one, we all have to vote, and we need to volunteer to help get others out to vote. I have been volunteering on the weekends with um, Indivisible Marin. Maybe others of you have been. Uh, last weekend, I made calls to North Carolina voters, and it was really great, and it's something that um, made me feel excited to be able to make a difference in key states, not just for the presidential election, but for um, Senate races as well. So get out there and volunteer. Divest and invest for a climate-safe future. You can go to gofossilfuel.org, Oh, sorry, go fossilfree.org and fossil free funds for information about that. Support community energy resilience bills when the next uh, session of the legislature comes. Support setbacks for oil and gas infrastructure away from homes and schools and kids. Tell your legislators to support a clean, green, and just climate recovery bond, other kinds of regulatory changes and fees for jobs in a climate safe future. Get involved with your local city council or sustainability commission and help develop, implement, and fund community energy resilience and climate action. And of course, if you aren't already purchasing 100% green power from marine clean energy, you should. Um, ditch your SUV, make your next car an electric vehicle, plan to use it as a backup power source, or ditch your car. I, I just wanna point out that um, I recently bought an inverter, and in my Nissan LEAF, um, I have the equivalent power of two Tesla power walls. Um, so we can use our electric vehicle to make a difference when our electricity goes out through planned or unplanned outages. And we can also use it in a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We need to use more mass transit, shared transit, e-bikes and other micro mobility, reduce airplane travel, enjoy staycations. Maybe that's not something we've all been doing actually during COVID working from home more and supporting telecommuting policies, making energy efficiency and electrical improvements to your home, including wiring uh, for EV charging. And so I did wanna mention taking advantage of resilient neighborhoods efforts and being engaged in that. They have a fantastic program. 
Um, switch to electric lawn equipment, electric induction stoves, electric appliances and hot water heaters and heat pumps. Insulate your home, start insulating uh, windows and doors. Eat locally grown organic food, avoid industrial grown meats, engage young people in education, habitat restoration, use less waste, less refuse, reduce, reuse, take action, support the climate center. We can and are making a difference. We need to be bold, take risks and innovate for a healthy, equitable future. We have choices. This is what Marin Headlands could have looked like or San Francisco Bay, but because people took action, we made a difference. And we heard Ann Christine introduce this today. One person can make a difference. Together, we make an even bigger difference. Just think about it. US renewables produce more electricity than coal for the first time in 130 years in 2019, and it's cheaper. Here's the headline for February 2030, based on doing what we know we need to do. California is the first state to reach net negative emissions. We kickstart the nation and the world in speed and scale climate action, February 2030. Drawdown and resilience are increasing despite record-breaking drought, thanks to climate-friendly natural working lands management, August 2035. And the headline in the New York, the virtual New York Times, after the elections in November 2040, huge amounts of money being invested in getting us on track to 350 parts per million. Ecosystems and communities are healthy and resilient. And who won the election? The Sunrise Party wins the presidency. This is our future. The future is not written in stone. We can make it what we want it to be, but we have to take action today. Thank you very much. Wow, Ellie. <laughs> you pack a lot in a presentation. I'll say that. <laughs> and, you know, I was watching the questions, you know, what can a person do? And there is, oh, Ellie's talking about that. Okay. And then you said, another question was, do you think the Green New Deal is enough? I'm like, mm, I think Ellie's covered that as well. Um, which is, you know, Ellie, Working on climate is hard. It is so hard. You show us all that information and you can feel like the anxiety and, and sense of despair building. The challenges are huge. They're complex. The stakes are, God, higher than anything we can imagine. And there's no immediate comprehensive win in sight. Yet you seem to have boundless energy and enthusiasm <laughs> for this work. Can you tell us how do you manage to stay positive and energetic? Because we're, we're talking to people who want to start taking action now and we're all going to need to know how to bolster ourselves on the path. Can you tell us how you manage to stay positive and energetic while also taking in so much bad news on climate? Um, for me, so first of all, I have to just say, I personally was born with a happy gene. <laughs> and so I have a natural propensity to be optimistic, but it's much more than that. It's being active for the solution. So last Wednesday, when we woke up to those red orange skies, it freaked me out, no question. And I'm sure many of you were um, frightened by it. I mean, it was really scary. And what did I do? I had a meeting together of my key staff we spent an hour and a half brainstorming. How can we take advantage of this moment? Many people are waking up and feeling exactly as we are. Many people in Sacramento, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, all over California. And so for me, the antidote to despair is action. It really is about taking action. And we all can take action in all sorts of ways. Just by being here today and coming together as community is one step in that direction. We, as I, I, I listed all kinds of things that we can do from state and federal policy efforts to what we can do in our own homes and being engaged with groups like Environmental Forum of Marin or Resilient Neighborhoods. We need to do that. We need to do all of it. And each one of us has unique talents and skills that we bring to it. So each of us can figure out what's right for us and then start doing it. You will feel much better it's not that I never feel sad about it. I definitely do. But I really target and uh, funnel that energy to make a difference for our future. That's great. You know, I'm told that we do actually have a little, a few more minutes than I thought. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're One thing I don't think you really talked about is what can we do to address climate inequities in our vulnerable communities in Marin? Oh, that's great. Um, well, the Climate Center is working with some folks here in Marin, both uh, just got a grant from the County of Marin 
to do community microgrid planning, um, both in Marin City and in the Canal District. And so um, that's one effort, just to be able to be independent energy-wise is quite significant. But more than that is that in any policy that we make, not just on climate change, but in everything that we do, that we make sure we are giving that equal opportunity, if you will, to those communities. I mean, I keep thinking about when we go to the food store with our masks on and the people, the, all the people who are on the front lines of COVID and climate, and that they are risking their lives to allow us to keep living our lives and maintain our living standards. We need to make sure that we are taking care of them as well in every policy that we undertake. So for example, so with this microgrids, we at the Climate Center had decided that we wanted to do six demonstration projects across the state. And uh, we decided that we would do them in low income communities. It would be easy and fast to do them not in low income communities, but we feel it's really important to demonstrate our principles in, in the kinds of work that we're doing. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I think we're becoming more and more aware of how interlinked these various, um, various social crises are at the moment. You know, someone asked a question, which it, I, I'm pulling up because I find it something that I often hear referred to, but it's not all that clear to me. What part does, we hear a lot about plastics. What part does the dependency and demand and on plastic play in climate change? Well, that's a great point. Um, plastics are basically oil products. And um, they, the plastic use has been pushed in a big way by oil and gas companies as they see the writing on the wall. We have to remember that oil and gas is declining in terms of investment globally and in the United States. Like just recently, Exxon was kicked off the Dow Industrial Average for the first time in its entire history, which is quite amazing. I mean, just think about it. Exxon is not on the Dow anymore. Um, and so what's happening is as they start to lose investors and market share, if you will, um, they are looking at what are their alternatives? How can they keep using their product, their product of fossil fuels? And so they have been promoting plastics like crazy especially the past 10 years, but even more so right now. So that's kind of scary because not only is it continuing fossil fuel pollution, but in the form of plastics, especially when we're using it for food products or uh, all kinds of things, and we know that we are polluting the environment, we're polluting ourselves with plastics, we need really to move to become plastic free. And so uh, it's another effort by the oil industries. I think Ultimately, this divestment movement, which is really starting to work, it was something that was launched by 350.org, uh, it's working. We all need to divest. I spent time myself with our financial advisor this year, or actually it was last fall. We went through where, I mean, I don't have a lot of money, but our little bit of investments to make sure that we were doing everything possible not to be supporting the continuation of the fossil fuel economy. We can each do that as a start. That's, that's great. Thank you for helping make that link clearer. Um, you know, one thing that's, that's particular in people's minds right now is this whole issue of controlled burns and, you know, they add yet more carbon to the atmosphere and don't we already have a lot of burning? Do you, do, do you have any thoughts on, on the whole issue of forest management that we're dealing with now? Yes, yeah. Um, well, I mentioned some of this, that we, we definitely need controlled burns. We need... Um, so because we've had these hundred years of uh, fire suppression policy, we've actually built up fuels. I read one scientist report that said the number of trees in forests in California today and in the West generally, like 20 times higher than they were 150 years ago. So our forests really were more savanna-like actually with regular fire, they were more open. And with that, it meant that also held more water. This is an interesting concept. Trees are like straws in the soil. They're sucking water out of the soil. When we have the right balance between soil and trees, we can actually hold more water and have more water in the creeks and streams that are key to our agricultural economy and to our cities in California. Um, but a lot of people, uh, I, I for one, when there were controlled burns and if that smoke meant there was smoke in the air, I thought, oh my God, why are they doing that? I hate having this smoke. Well, now I think we might all have a little different opinion about that. It, there have been studies that have shown that controlled burns actually have less toxic smoke 
than wildfires. So number one, we can take our medicine one way or the other. I'd rather take it where we plan for it in advance. Um, number two, that if we can do it at scale, we can reduce this um, catastrophic impacts of fires that we're seeing. So fire is a natural part of Western ecosystems. We have to accept that we're living in it. Somebody asked how many um, homes are in the WUI, that wildlife, uh, wildfire urban interface uh, mm -hmm. district. And it's like one third of all the houses in California are in WUI districts. My home is here in San Anselmo. So we have chosen to live in these fire prone areas. Um, we can't destroy ecosystems to make it so we can keep living here. We have to have healthy ecosystems to sustain life as we know it. And at the same time, we have to manage for fire. So it means to me that control burns are a critical part of our future. I do know that the governor had negotiated something with the president um, whereby we made an agreement to do together a million acres of control burns a year in California. But remember that we're 100 million acres in the state. It's not just about forests. It's about grasslands and coastal scrub habitat and all the other habitats. And so um, we're going to need a lot more than a million acres a year to address the kind of conflagration we're experiencing right now and to really be more fire prepared. And at the same time, we can invest in healthy ecosystem management, both on working lands and natural lands for more sequestration and all the co-benefits that I mentioned. Thank you so much for that. That, that really helps illuminate it for me. I, all the information I did not know. I've got like one California question and one international question. Let me go to the international one first. I know that's not really the focus of the Climate Center, but you know, we look at all the efforts we're making here to reduce, well, <laughs> Some of, some of us are making, some states are making to reduce uh, carbon pollution, but meanwhile, China still has 121 gigawatts of coal plants under construction or some similarly massive, or, which is more than is being built in the rest of the world combined. What's your view on that? Do you think that the world can derail China in that effort? Do you think economics is going to overwhelm them in the process of that? Or do you have a view on that issue? Yes, yes and yes. <laughs> I think that... Um, First of all, I, I always believe, and over all the years I've worked on climate change, I've, I've often been asked, well, what about China? And I would say, first, let's take care of our backyard first. Let's, mm -hmm. let's really do the right thing first. And I mentioned how many oil wells we have here in California and how, how big of a producer we are. We're not the biggest at all. But first, let's take care of our own backyard and deal with that. But that being said, the economics are against China uh, really being successful in all those plants. And, um, and India as well. So we need to demonstrate what can be done here. We also need leadership. There's no question. I think of this moment as Newsom's uh, Winston Churchill moment, where I think of Winston Churchill, World War II, where yeah. um, the British didn't really want to get involved. The United States didn't want to get involved in, in fighting the Nazis. And it really was about the future of civilization, at least from a first world point of view, right? And like, so how are we going to keep moving forward? And he really spoke to that moment. That kind of leadership, he, he not only galvanized the public in the UK, he galvanized other leaders around the world. And so I think Gavin Newsom and ultimately President Biden will be needing to do that and uh, not just speaking it, but doing it, living it, showing the example of what needs to happen by the policies that we enact in the United States. When we start really taking it seriously, we will have a huge influence on China. And we can do all kinds of things economically and culturally to help make that happen, and with India as well. But we have to demonstrate it first here. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things that I really, I've read a lot about the work of the Climate Center. And one thing I really, resonate with is the fact that um, the goal seems ambitious but within our grasp and as you've said several times once we've proven it works in California then it just becomes a much more compelling argument for other parts of the world. Um, so what, what so you've, you spoke about so many things that ordinary citizens can do so I'm kind of going through the list and trying to figure out what we haven't really covered what you haven't already covered. <laughs> People might need to go through the slides later on and they will be available by the way, um, so that they can catch some of the details. But one thing, one question that came in was how is, uh, what about 
this issue of carbon sequestration in Marin. Is there like some measure of the effectiveness of soil sequestra uh, carbon sequestration in soil? Is there some kind of inspection program or standards or something? And, and how do you see that might work in Marin? Yes, yeah, absolutely. In, in so um, in terms of agricultural soils, uh, the, um, uh, the Marin Carbon Project played a lead role in really helping the public in California and elected officials in California to understand what is possible in terms of carbon sequestration. It's also the Natural Resources Conservation Service has science-based uh, approaches to measuring carbon in soils. There are also efforts that measure it in vegetation and trees and other vegetation. And I see that Bill Carney is on this today. Hi, Bill. Uh, <laughs> Bill and I were on a uh, committee with the uh, um, Marin Drawdown to look at what we could do and uh, what, we were a what we might do here in Marin and how we can contribute to sequestration on a broader scale. Um, as part of that effort, we learned what was possible here in Marin just with ag lands and um, application of compost and better soil management, riparian restoration, silviculture, which is planting trees in um, uh, grasslands or rangelands, and all kinds of other approaches that can make it better for us. So um, there, there really are um, a number of, the science is there, we can do it. It's much more a matter of political will and how to scale it up. And I want to be clear, it, there's also not just carbon farming, and Bill and I have talked about this, there's carbon gardening. And there's uh, urban approaches to managing for carbon, for biodiversity, for um, ecological and uh, community resilience as well. And so we, we can implement all of that and we can create this future, as I said earlier, by investing in this range of activities. There isn't a single solution, it's a range of actions that we need to take. And I will say there may be, and almost certainly, there'll be things that won't work the way we thought they would work. And then we need to learn from it. So we have to do it in what we call an adaptive way, where we implement something, we assess it, we learn what worked, what didn't, we keep doing what did work, and we stop doing what didn't work, and we, we're creative and keep improving upon it. Thank you so much for that, because I think that has implications, as you were saying, not just for, you know, people running farms out in West Marin, but for, for those of us here on the call who are thinking about our own what we can do locally as well. And, you know, I, one, one question that came in, I think is an interesting one, which is, do you have any thoughts on how we can address land use laws to slow building in vulnerable areas, whether it is, like you said, riparian habitat, or whether it's more vulnerable to sea level rise, or yeah. whatever the environmental issue is? Do you have any ideas on that one? Yes, yeah, great question. Um, there are groups like Greenbelt Alliance here in the Bay Area that are, um, actively working to ensure that we have green belts around uh, each of our communities and expanding those green belts. But more than that, I think we are going to have to embrace this concept of managed retreat. So okay. first of all, we, number one, we should allow no more building on floodplains, on coastal habitat, um, in the wooey zone. No new building should be allowed. The second step is that, um, really that my own belief, even if my own house burned down, is that we should not allow rebuilding in places where houses burn down. They will burn again. The people in paradise, they lost their whole community and dozens of lives. That fire that's still burning up near Oroville just narrowly missed going through paradise two <laughs> years later, again. I mean, let's yeah. just be really clear. We shouldn't be rebuilding in those places. Places that flood, and now it's hard to think about flooding right now. I can't wait till we have rain again, but we will certainly have flooding again. And so sh we shouldn't be building on riparian areas, and, and we shouldn't be building um, right in the coastal areas where we know sea level rise will be accelerating. And so, um, so we need to stop that. And then um, we're going to eventually, in my opinion, have to have managed retreat. In fact, I just heard this concept of managed retreat in fire prone terrestrial areas as a new concept. Um, I just, I saw it on Twitter <laughs> actually the other day. And, uh, you know, we're gonna have to live in different ways and uh, to, to really secure a climate safe future. We can see it. We are living on the front lines of climate change. We're experiencing it firsthand in California right now in Oregon. And of course, there are other things going on all around the world right now in terms of fires, in terms of flooding um, and hurricanes right this moment. 
And so um, everything, all of these uh, natural phenomena have been greatly exacerbated by climate change, by the increased energy in the atmosphere from holding more of those green, the greenhouse gases, holding more energy in. And so to really be honest with ourselves, we're going to have to look at all of these uh, land use policies. And um, we should not be building anything more in open space for that matter. And we should use every inch of open space to restore to something that sequesters carbon, supports biodiversity, and helps make us more resilient. So that sounds like a lot of um, activism is needed at the city planning and, and county planning level. Absolutely. Yeah, with their long-term plans, that's great. Oh, and I don't know if you know this, but our next event, is rising by Elizabeth Rush. We'll be talking about uh, resilience and retreat from sea oh, level. Oh, fantastic. She wrote a fantastic book, which is all about communities that have had to retreat or are seriously considering retreating because of sea level rise. And as you say, in California, fire retreat is gonna have to be an uncomfortable topic of conversation as well. Exactly. Yeah, you know, they talk about hardening houses, like hardening uh, infrastructure. You can do it to a certain extent, but I know uh, sadly, a number of people who prepared their land, cleared the land, hardened their infrastructure, and still lost their homes. So we can do it, but that will not solve the problem. And in the end, it's really, we have to first look at the cause, which is increased greenhouse gas emissions, yes. both what's already in the atmosphere and what we produce every day, and taking action at home, in our communities, becoming more engaged, and being involved with Environmental Forum of Marin. Well, Thank you so much. It looks like we are, in fact, now out of time, but I'd like to invite you all to go learn more about Ellie and the work of the Climate Center at www.theclimatecenter.org. Um, and Ellie, thank you so much for your time today. I, it just feels strange not to be bursting into a round of applause, but <laughs> please know that I certainly feel inspired and appreciative, and I'm sure that I speak for all of us when I say a heartfelt thank you. So well, thank you.